All right, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody, to our third in the season, Science on Saturday. Um, and I know what all of y'all are thinking. What did Andrew do with his hair today? <laughs> so um, I'm Arturo Dominguez. I'm the head of the science education department. Um, I was actually hired by Andrew 11 years ago, um, and I have the role that he had when he hired me. Um, but uh, Andrew could not be here today. He, he's going to miss today and the next Saturday. He's at an, at an undisclosed location. It's, at the, it's in the south of France, actually. So, But um, so today I'll be, I'll be hosting. And then next week will be, the host will be the director of the lab, uh, Steve Cowley. So I think you'll, today you, you all got the, the, the least good host today. But, you know, I'll try to fill some, some good shit. <laughs> I wasn't fishing. I wasn't fishing. Um, so welcome. Um, I'm really excited about today's, uh, about today's talk with Professor Jesse Jenkins. Um, before we do those introductions, I see, I don't even have to say this because I, I got here and by the time I got here, there were no bagels. So y'all know about the bagels. <laughs> uh, there was some coffee. There was still some coffee. Good. Excellent. Um, uh, we've gone through this, but um, uh, just to, as a reminder, the masks are optional um, and uh, we are getting back to the pandemic. I think it's been going pretty well. Um, the... Um, Overflow participants will be asked to go to the cafeteria and we will hold all questions until the end of the presentation where I will be, uh, where I'll be moderating the questions. Um, wait for the microphones and so that I can call on you. Uh, we have right now 56 Zoom participants. Um, and be, remember to, to stay muted, uh, hold all questions till the end and we really encourage the raise hands function so that we can call on you as opposed to writing them in the chat. Uh, but if you really must write it in the chat, uh, you can go ahead and just know that all the talks are recorded. So today we have the pleasure of having Professor Jesse Jenkins give a talk on uh, net zero economy. Uh, professor Jenkins is an uh, system professor and macro scale energy systems engineer at Princeton University with a joint appointment in the Department of Mechanical and, Air and Aerospace Engineer and the Adlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. He's also an affiliated faculty member with the Center for Policy Research and Energy Environment at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and an associated faculty member at the High Meadows Environmental Institute. So just a few things. Just just a couple of things. Just a couple. Uh, so I've already informed our speaker that since the time of Ronald Hatcher, we've been asking all of our speakers these famous three questions. So Jesse, first question, what got you excited into the topic that you're going to talk about today? So I first uh, got turned on to energy systems and climate challenge uh, in the middle of my undergraduate studies at the University of Oregon. And you know, took a class just as an elective on a whim um, that was on the environmental impacts of energy systems. And I, you know, learned about all of the many challenges associated with the energy system, learned about the energy system itself, which for most of us, I think is just in the background. We, you know, we flip a switch, we go to the gas station, like we just assume this stuff all kind of happens fairly easily. Learned about sort of the massive scale of these systems and their impacts all over the world, and particularly on climate change. I was a software engineering, uh, computer science undergraduate. I thought I'd go into you know, software engineering as a career, but I decided that this was a topic that I could spend my whole life working on. Huge challenge. I didn't know exactly at the time how I would fit into that challenge, but what I felt like was that this was a meaningful you know, career of work that I could devote my life to, um, try to find whatever biggest lever I could grab and try to yank on it and move the, you know, move the energy system in a positive direction. And so I've been on that path for the last, God, nearly 20 years now. <laughs> <laughs> Three years it's just become yeah. more and more relevant. So, exactly. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Uh, the second question: Who inspired you? What teacher? What professor inspired you? To... Yeah. So in this class, uh, the professor was uh, Gregory Bothan at the University of Oregon. He's a uh, astrophysicist by training, and I think similarly just got interested in energy challenges and the environment, and kind of went down a rabbit hole himself, um, and began teaching this class uh, probably four or five years before I took it. Uh, so the early two thousands, um, and. He is, you know, if, if, if any folks meet him or go check out his lectures online, he sort of styles himself like a mad scientist. He's got, you know, big hair and he's quite, uh, quite exciting to talk oh, about. Yeah. He makes lots of fun, uh, fun, nerdy jokes. And uh, 
uh, he was a very, you know, very entertaining and engaging professor. Um, and, you know, was on the forefront of using kind of interactive technology in the in the in the classroom to try to get us engaged. So we would do these live exercises with laptops and clickers and things like that. Again, this is early 2000s, so stuff that's common commonplace now, but not so much then. And he was just a very inspiring professor. So not only was the topic interesting and challenging and worthwhile, he made it really accessible and fun, um, and set me off in a whole new direction. Sounds amazing. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's one of the things that inspired me to become a professor as well, because think about if you have that impact on like one person right. in your class of 20 or 30 or 40 people, and they spend their whole career working on this problem, that's a huge impact, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. And when you're not doing all of this really important work <laughs> and with all these positions, uh, what do you do on your free time? Uh, so I have two kids, uh, two and that's six. So that's, that's your that's answer, it. right? Yep. There. <laughs> <laughs> I do this and I do that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's give our speaker a round of applause and Thanks. please take it away. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk today about the game plan or the, uh, the playbook to get our economy to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. That's the point where human caused greenhouse gas emissions of carbon dioxide or methane or others are exactly equaled out by human-caused removals of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So whether that's enhancing the amount of carbon that our lands take up in, in soil or, or uh, forests, or using mechanical or, or chemical means to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it safely underground, we have to balance those two things out because carbon dioxide is effectively a stock problem. Carbon dioxide, once emitted, lasts in the atmosphere for centuries timescales. So for human purposes, at least, it's effectively permanent. And the cumulative increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is what drives climate change. And so until we get to this point globally of net zero greenhouse gas emissions, we're effectively digging ourselves a deeper hole when it comes to the impacts of climate change all around us, which we're already starting to feel. Right? So the first rule of holes is when you find yourself in one, stop digging. Then you can figure out how to get out of it. Okay? And we're still on that path. We have not yet stopped digging. Greenhouse gas emissions globally have not yet peaked, although they're starting to look like maybe they've entered a plateau. Um, and we need to drive them down rapidly. And as the United States, of course, we're both a major emitter. We've emitted the most historically and contributed the most historically to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere now. And we're the second largest emitter today, although we're making progress in driving down those emissions. So the U.S. has a kind of, I think, moral obligation to, to take a lead, given our uh, cumulative role, um, and also the technological and financial means to lead. And I think that's important not just to demonstrate that we're reducing our emissions, but also to harness that technological ingenuity, the kind of work that happens here at PPPL or Princeton or in the innovative companies uh, that spin off around this, these places, um, and also our wealth to basically buy down the early costs of these technologies, to deploy them here in the US where we can afford them and make them cheap enough for the rest of the world to adopt. So the US is central to this challenge. We're not the whole thing, right? We can't do it on our own, but we can make an enormous difference um, in the, the fight against climate change. And so this talk will focus mostly on how do we get the US on this pathway. And we're actually at a really interesting, I think, pivotal moment uh, in that fight, because in 2021 and 2022, the 117th Congress, after President Biden was inaugurated the first two years uh, of this, uh, this term, the Congress passed a series of laws that collectively put the full financial might of the federal government behind the clean energy transition for the first time in our history. I'm talking pr primarily about the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and the, infra uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which are two massive pieces of legislation passed in the last Congress that effectively put clean energy on sale. So the approach of these laws is to try to shift the myriad decisions that we all have to make in our lives about how to you know, drive to work or school or pick up our kids, how to heat our homes, uh, that businesses are making every day about what fleet of vehicles to purchase or how to power their industrial facilities or processes and effectively put Uncle Sam's thumb on the scale of the green side of the ledger against the dirty side, right? And they do that through a series of tax credits, grants, rebates, loan guarantees, and direct public investments to build out some enabling infrastructure, like say, EV charging networks or high voltage transmission lines. And by doing so, we effectively make the clean energy options the just better business decision or better household financial decision. And that really tips the scales in this effort, because unless, I think this is necessary, perhaps not sufficient, but unless the economics make sense to transition towards cleaner sources for households and businesses, 
we can't expect us to do it at the scale and pace that we need to just out of the goodness of our heart or our sort of willingness to help in this global cause, right? There's some people who are willing to pay more to do that, but not 360 million Americans, right? Um, not at the scale that we need to move the, the sort of super tanker in the right direction. Now, of course, there's two ways you can shift this balance. You can make the clean energy cheaper, or you can make the fossil energy more expensive. That's the approach that carbon taxing or carbon uh, emissions caps uh, try to apply. Europe has taken that route. Uh, Canada has a national carbon price. Uh, a couple of states in the US, like Washington and California, have emissions programs. Congress tried to pass a law like that in 2009, but I don't think you need to be a political scientist to kind of understand intuitively that making current energy sources more expensive is a lot more difficult politically than making the alternatives cheaper and more attractive, right? So if we, you know, raise the price at the pump today, that would encourage you to maybe go buy an EV, but in the meantime, you're just paying more at the pump, right? And people don't really want to do that. So uh, this, con this time around, after failing in 2009 and 2010 to pass a cap and trade bill that would have limited greenhouse gas emissions, raised the cost of polluting, uh, the Congress this time effectively tried a carrots rather than sticks approach, driving down the cost of the alternatives. And they did that basically across the board for all of the ingredients in a clean energy system that we might want to deploy. That includes all forms of clean electricity, including subsidies to keep our existing nuclear reactors running as long as it's safe to do so. They provide about a fifth of all of our electricity today and about half of all of our carbon-free electricity, even more so here in New Jersey, where we get over a third of our electricity from three nuclear reactors. And so that's a critical foundation to build on. We don't want to be replacing those at the same time that we're trying to drive out coal and natural gas from our mix. So that actually helps New Jersey a lot, I should say, because we were previously paying for those costs in our own rates. Uh, starting in 2024, 20, uh, the federal government's going to pick up most, if not all, of that tab for us. So that's nice. Um, it also supports, importantly, all of the new sources of clean electricity that, as I'll show you in a minute, we have to deploy at an unprecedented pace. That includes wind and solar, new nuclear, geothermal, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it also provides new tax credits for important fuels like hydrogen that could play a critical role in a low-carbon economy, clean fuels like synthetic aviation fuel that we could use to decarbonize jet travel, uh, and other things like that. It supports and expands a tax credit for carbon capture and storage that we might be able to use at large point source emissions, uh, like power plants or refineries, to capture CO2 and safely store it underground. And this is probably the one that, uh, the, the next two are the ones that we most engage with in our lives, right? Which is personal and business tax credits for electric vehicles that as of this year are available at the point of sale. So if you go and buy an EV from a dealership, you can get up to $7,500 off the purchase price of that EV right at the point of sale, rather than having to wait uh, and file your taxes in April and get a tax rebate later. So that's an important change that just started in January. If you lease a vehicle, the businesses get that tax credit and should be, if the market's competitive, and I think this is happening right now, should be passing on that $7,500 to you in the form of a lower lease price. And that's really transformative. If you think about the cost of financing a car, whether you're taking out a loan or leasing it, a big chunk of what you're paying for in a lease in particular is the depreciation in the car over the first three years or whatever the length of the lease is. And if you basically add a $7,500 down payment, which is effectively what the tax credit does, that can cut the cost of leasing an EV in half, effectively, under current interest rates. So if you go out right now and look at the price of a new lease for a, for a car, any car, chances are some of the most attractive lease deals out there right now will be for electric vehicles. So again, this is what I mean by shifting fundamentally the incentives. You don't have to do it because you care about the environment, you want to be an early adopter, et cetera. It's just the better car that's cheaper right now. Right? And that is fundamentally transformative. There's also a range of tax credits for energy efficiency and electrification of your homes, putting in things like heat pumps that could switch, switch out for gas boilers or furnaces in your house, uh, energy efficiency upgrades to your home, uh, upgrading the wiring and panels so you can accommodate EVs and heat pumps and other electrification uh, solutions. And for those who don't have enough tax appetite or um, to take those tax credits, there's a set of rebates that um, are provided about $9 billion or $16 billion in two programs out to states. Uh, including New Jersey, which is setting up to take advantage of this, uh, for low- and middle-income households uh, to take advantage of the, those funding opportunities as well. So really quite a range of incentives across the board in buildings, transportation, fuels, electricity, um, a little bit in industry as well, although that's an area where we probably need to do more in the future. And there's good signs that these incentives are already working. There's a website you can go on called cleaninvestmentmonitor.org that's set up by MIT and the Rhodium Group that has been painstakingly assembling all of the data on investments across the clean energy economy in the United States on a quarterly basis. 
So they just put out their Q3 2023 numbers. So they're you know, maybe running about five, five months behind real time, but a pretty close to real time look at what's happening across the US economy. And I put a couple of key points there. IIJA is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That's the infrastructure law. It was passed in um, November of 2021. And the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, which was passed in the summer of 2022. And you can see that after that point, we're seeing quite an uptick in the scale and pace of investment. So just over the last 12 months leading up to uh, the end of, uh, of Q3, so up to the end of uh, September uh, 2023, we saw $225 billion invested across the United States in the clean energy economy. $64 billion in Q3 2023 alone, that's a 42% year-on-year increase. So anytime you're seeing 40%, you know, double-digit compound annual growth rates, that is a huge rapid increase in investment in any sector of the economy, right? And so we're starting to see these impacts already, and this is despite the fact that much of the last year after the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act was spent basically establishing the programs that are just now starting to get money out the door. So we had to write a bunch of new tax credit rules that have been steadily being cranked out by the Treasury Department to implement these rules. The Department of Energy and the EPA and the Department of Transportation and others that have these grant programs have to set up the grant programs, have to get requests for proposals, have to assess them, have to get the money out the door, right? That all takes quite a little, lot of time. So I'm very excited about what might happen over the next 12 or 24 months, because now is the point where that money is really starting to hit the economy and show up in people's pockets and show up in the investments that we're seeing. And so 2024 and 2025 could be really, really accelerated relative to the trends that we're seeing so far. Now, all of this also means we're making more rapid progress on the path to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Right? It's all well and good that we see lots of investments across the economy. That's good for you know, workers. That's good for, for politics, probably. But if it doesn't drive down greenhouse gas emissions, then it's not really helping us uh, with, the, with the central challenge. What we've seen, actually, is that the US has peaked its greenhouse gas emissions already. Uh, we had our peak emissions around 2005 to 2007 at about 6.6 .6 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. That's fallen by about a billion tons through 2021. It's bounced around a little bit over the last couple of years, but about the same level. And that's, of course, despite the fact that the economy has expanded quite a lot over that period. So we're, we've effectively decoupled economic growth from CO2 emissions. They used to go up hand in hand. Now one is going up and the other is going down. That's great. That's step one. Step two is making it go down much faster, right? Because what we estimated in a project that I launched in 2021 called the Repeat Project, which has been basically using macro scale energy system modeling tools, like the kind that we develop in my group, uh, to, to regularly assess the impact of federal policy, both while it's being debated, so during the whole congressional debates in 2021 and 2022, and kind of close to real time, and then on a regular basis, updating uh, a snapshot of where we're headed uh, under current and proposed policies. What we found is that if you freeze all US policy at the beginning of January 2021, before the last Congress and the administration, uh, the Biden administration took over, we were on basically the same trajectory to cut emissions about the same pace as that we have, that we have since 2007, which is about 2% per year. So that's you know, progress, but as you can see, nowhere near fast enough to get us to 50% below our peak levels by 2030. That's the uh, goal that President Biden has committed the country to as part of the international effort to, to combat climate change, uh, or to net zero emissions, so zero point on this, this graph, uh, by 2050. Now, our estimates are that thanks to passages of the laws in the last Congress, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Law, we have basically doubled the pace of decarbonization in the United States to about 4% per year. That's enough to get us to about 40% below greenhouse gas emissions, plus or minus a couple percent by 2030, and about 50% by 2035. So we're making much more rapid progress. You'll notice those lines sort of flatline after about 2035. That's because much of the programs in these laws expire over the next decade. So we, have, we bought ourselves about a decade of policy progress, but this can't be the last law that we pass at the federal level if we want to accelerate progress further, right? So huge step forward, but, but um, not the last one. And even that accelerated pace still, to be fair, falls short of the pace that we would need to be on to hit that 50% reduction by 2030 and be on track for net zero by 2050. The one other way to think about it is that we're basically running about five years behind schedule. Our estimates are that we will hit that 50% reduction from peak levels uh, by 2035, plus or minus a year, instead of 2030, which is the goal that we are trying to be on. So there's a gap to be closed. We're currently running uh, additional modeling right now with Repeat Project to assess the impacts of all of the proposed regulations 
that the Biden administration has also been promulgating, whether that's tailpipe emission standards for vehicles, power plant uh, pollution rules that are going to help reduce emissions in the power sector, appliance standards the Department of Energy has been rapidly getting out to improve efficiency in homes and businesses. All of that adds up as well and will help close some of this gap. It's also up to states to help close the gap further, including New Jersey. By buying down the cost of all of the action that we're talking about, by shifting that cost onto Uncle Sam's checkbook instead of ours, we should be able to increase the level of ambition in every state in the country, right? Whatever made political or economic sense to New Jersey or California or Wyoming or wherever, um, before the passage of this law, we've now taken 30% or so of the cost of action and transferred it onto the federal tax base. And we should be able to therefore increase our ambitions here at the state level. And in fact, we've already seen Governor Murphy do so, accelerating a target to get to 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050, which was the goal before passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, to 2035, which is the executive order he issued last year. Now, that's an executive order. It has no force if Governor Murphy's gone, right? What we have to do is pass legislation to ultimately codify that. And there's legislation being worked on in the legislature right now uh, to try to pass uh, that into statute, to enact 100% carbon-free electricity by 2035. So that, uh, that, and our group has done modeling on that at Princeton, and we found that effectively we can hit that goal while paying the same electricity rates as, for bulk power as we do now, thanks to the passage of this law. And I should say that you might be saying, well, I'm a taxpayer and a rate payer, so are, are we just moving this from one pocket to the other? But the passage of these laws are funded primarily um, by an increase in taxes on uh, corporations that make a billion dollars or more that we're not paying at least 15% taxes. So there's a new corporate minimum tax that is um, requiring them to pay at least 15% tax rate. So they can't uh, drive down their taxes to zero with all kinds of different uh, tax uh, strategies. Um, and by increasing IRS enforcement on tax cheats. So unless you're a tax cheat or a giant com company that hasn't been paying uh, their fair share, you're actually not paying for this stuff. Um, it's, it's paid for primarily in that, that manner. So it's a very progressive, I should say, way to uh, lower the cost of the clean energy transition and to make states um, more likely to increase their ambition like we can here in New Jersey. Um, so we can do more to close this gap. Hopefully we will do so over time and repeat projects are gonna be regularly assessing progress um, on a roughly six to 12 month basis uh, to update where we are on this path. All right, so let's look at how we actually get all the way to net zero greenhouse gas emissions and let's sort of size up the overall economy wide challenge to start. And then I'm gonna dive into particularly the role of the electricity sector, which is really central to the problem. So let's uh, try to understand why that is. So this chart here shows uh, a projection for 2050 of all of our final energy carriers. So that's fuels and electricity and steam, the kinds of things that bring energy into our homes and businesses, and then we can turn that energy into you know, uh, mobility or uh, manufacturing steel or heating our homes or cooling our homes. So those are the services we want. And what we can see is this, this is a frozen policy scenario. So this is if we're not trying to decarbonize the economy. And it looks a lot actually like today's electricity or today's overall energy mix. So if I showed you the 2022 mix, it would be very similar to this. And the one thing I want to point out here is that about a third of that, uh, that total final energy uh, consumption is from carbon-free energy carriers, mostly electricity, but also steam, which we use in a lot of industrial processes. And these are energy carriers or fuels that themselves contain no greenhouse gas emissions, right? If I plug into the wall and start using electricity, it's not like there's a smokestack spitting out CO2 into my house, right? Or into the, the street. Um, and so when we use them, there's no direct emissions. And that means if we can produce those fuels in a way that has no carbon dioxide emissions, and we have a lot of different ways to produce heat and uh, electricity without carbon emissions, whether that's wind or solar or nuclear uh, or others, um, then we have basically a full pathway from generation to transportation to use that is emissions free. That's what we want our future energy system to look like. The bigger challenge is this other two thirds of the pie, which are liquid and gaseous hydrocarbon fuels, AKA gasoline, jet fuel, diesel, and natural gas. Okay. These are very useful fuels. There's a reason why we use them. They're very energy dense. They're easy to ship around the world or around the country in pipelines and tankers and, and, and uh, trucks. But unfortunately, of course, these are hydrocarbons. So when we burn them, we're emitting not only pollution, but also direct greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, right? And so um, the, the challenge is gonna be to uh, either find carbon neutral ways to produce these fuels so that the CO2 that's being emitted when we burn something originally came from the atmosphere and it's just a circular kind of cycle, 
or to substitute these for carbon-free energy carriers, or to capture the greenhouse gas emissions and prevent them from going into the atmosphere. So we have options to tackle these sectors. Carbon capture and storage, as I mentioned, from very large point source emitters, so big factories or facilities where you have the economies of scale to make sense, and where you're near enough to places where we can actually safely store this CO2, which may not include places like New Jersey. Um, you may be able to capture CO2 through a fairly expensive process to stack on to the end of the power plant or the smokestack, the flue gas, strip that CO2 out through chemical means, and safely store it um, underground for centuries timescales. That adds cost to any of these facilities, but it's something we could do. We could also develop carbon neutral substitutes for those fuels where we do need liquid or gaseous fuels. That could be hydrogen, could be some sustainable biofuels, um, or it could be what are called electrofuels or synthetic fuels where we basically take CO2 from either the atmosphere or from biomass, from you know, corn stover or, or uh, forest residues, and we straight take that CO2 out, and then we take a bunch of energy to make hydrogen, and then we take a bunch more energy to uh, put them together into long chain hydrocarbons that act like gasoline or diesel or jet fuel. Now, as you can tell from that process, it's going to take a lot of energy to do that. Energy to get the CO2, energy to get the hydrogen, energy to fight thermodynamics and put them together into a long chain hydrocarbon and then transport it and burn it. So the challenge with that is that it's extremely expensive, right? And we would not want to do that in any large scale volumes. The other option is that we could just keep using fossil fuels where it's extremely valuable or difficult to decarbonize and find ways to offset that in the net equation of net zero. We can do that by directly pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere with um, enhanced uh, uh, biological processes, enhanced weathering of rocks, or chemical processes that pull CO2 and chemical sorbents out of the atmosphere. The challenge there is that CO2 is very diffuse in the atmosphere. It's a very small fraction. And so it takes a lot of energy to suck that CO2 out of the air and stick it underground. And so if we're going to do that, it's going to take a lot of equipment and a lot of energy, and it's going to end up very expensive. So there are drawbacks to all of these strategies. There are fundamental limits to scale because of geology or the availability of sustainable uh, feedstocks for bioenergy that don't negatively impact um, the environment or the, the cost of food, um, or just you know, the sheer thermodynamic penalty that we have to pay to do all this work, which is going to require a high amount of energy inputs. So ideally, we don't want to lean very hard on any of these four strategies. We, want, we can use them, but we want to limit them to an area, a, a smaller scale, and only where it's really valuable to do so and where we don't have cheaper alternatives. So if you go look at our Net Zero America study that we worked on here at, the United, uh, at, at Princeton or any other of the recent uh, reports that look at pathways to decarbonize the US economy or even any, uh, anywhere else, they all have a common feature, which is that they rely on the electricity sector to dramatically expand so that we can supply as much of our final energy needs as possible with electricity or steam or hydrogen derived from electricity through electrolysis and knock down the scale of reliance on those hydrocarbon fuels to a much more manageable level that is, and, and, and only in use cases that are high enough value that it's worth paying those additional costs associated with uh, the four options I just mentioned. And so this is what a net zero economy might look like with 75% of our final energy instead of one third coming from electricity, only about a quarter from hydrocarbons, and you'll notice that the bar sh shrunk dramatically as well, right? From about 70 quadrillion BTUs. That's just a big thing. Don't worry about it. Um, so that quad is, a, is, is just a, about 170th of all final energy consumption today. Um, knocking that down to, by about a third to less than 50. The reason for that is that we get a kind of a twofer when we electrify things. An electric vehicle or a heat pump is much more efficient at taking the electricity in your battery or in your you know, electric wires and turning that into the services that you care about than the combustion processes that we rely on today. So of the fuel that you put into your gas tank, only about a quarter of that ends up driving you down the road. And the rest of it is lost to your exhaust and to heating up the air around you and to friction in your engine and, and rolling resistance in the tires. Electric vehicles are about three times more efficient than that when you account for regenerative braking and the high efficiency of electric drives. And so we don't need as much final energy delivered to when we switch to uh, EVs. It's not a one-for-one -one trade for gasoline. You only need about a third as much electricity as you need gasoline. And the same is true for heat pumps. Heat pumps are kind of magic. They're 300% efficient. It's because they're not changing energy forms. They're just moving them around. So you do a little bit of uh, mechanical work to compress and, and, and release a gas. Um, and by putting in one unit of electricity, you can get three or four units of heat moving in or out of your home. 
And everybody has heat pumps all around them. There's every, every refrigerator in your home runs on a heat pump, steadily pulling uh, heat out of your uh, fridge and dumping it into your living room or your kitchen. Um, all of our air conditioners work through the same way. And so a heat pump is simply a reversible air conditioner that can both cool your home and heat it in the winter by taking a little bit of the heat out of the ambient air, even when it's cold outside, and pulling it into your house. Right? And this is a very efficient process, much more so than combustion, which even the best you know, efficient boilers might be 90, 95% efficient. These are effectively 300% or 400% efficient. And again, that sounds like it violates some law of physics, but trust me, it doesn't. It's just a thermodynamic work cycle because we're moving heat around, not, not creating it. All right, so that all knocks down the amount of uh, final energy. That's good. We don't have to build quite as much infrastructure to supply electricity as you might think. However, if we're going to expand the role of the electricity sector from a third of today's pie to 75% of admittedly a smaller pie, we're going to have to dramatically increase the amount of electricity we supply in the country. And this is a really dramatic shift in how things have worked over the last you know, roughly generation in the US. So from the 1980s to 2005, demand for electricity in the US was growing steadily at about 2.5% per year, roughly in line with, with uh, GDP, with the, the growth of the economy. This is slower than the previous period of you know, major expansion in the post-war era from the, you know, so the 1930s New Deal on through the 1970s, uh, where it was actually growing even faster than this at 3 to 5% per year. But then something really fundamental shifted around 2005, 2006, and since then, we've basically had flat demand for electricity in the United States. And again, that's even as the economy's grown and people use more electricity uh, services, we've actually demanded uh, a flat amount of overall electricity input. I think there's really three reasons for this. Um, one is the, uh, the, the accelerating globalization of the US economy. China joined the WTO around this time, started to become a, the factory for the world, and the US started to source a lot more of our goods from abroad than, than earlier. And you know, this is a trend that had been ongoing of sort of deindustrialization through the 70s and 80s and 90s, but really accelerated in the 2000s. Additionally, a lot of our economic growth during this period came from financial services. Of course, a lot of that went poof in the great financial crisis, but you know, that was part of it. Um, and from uh, retail services and things like that. And those just don't take a lot of energy to produce economic growth, as opposed to building physical stuff right in factories. And during this period, we had an increasing focus on environmental causes and on energy efficiency which helped drive down um, overall energy consumption. New Jersey has been a leader in this area, at promoting energy efficiency in homes and buildings. And so we're able to do a lot more with less, and that helps us support economic growth and increased energy services while keeping electricity demand relatively flat. That is gonna fundamentally shift as we start to electrify more of our daily lives and our businesses, right? So if you shift uh, an EV, you know, you shift from electric car to an EV, your total amount of energy use in your, in your, your life is gonna go down, but of course, the amount that you're going to pay on your electricity bill is going to go up, and that's going to be offset by the fact that you never have to go to a gas station again right, and pay for gas at the pump. But that's going to shift a lot of our demand onto the electricity sector, whether it's for heat pumps or for uh, gasoline, uh, shifting to, to internal, combustion, or sorry, internal combustion engines, shifting to electric vehicles, or producing hydrogen, or electrifying industrial processes. All of that is going to demand more energy. And so our estimates from the REPEAT project are that over the next roughly decade, we should expect demand to resume the kind of growth that we haven't seen since the 1980s and 90s, about 2% per year, plus or minus a bit, which is enough to expand demand by nearly half, about 42%, 45% uh, by 2035. So this is a big shift. You think about we've had 20 so years of you know, the entire industry, whether it's executives or regulators or academics or whoever, thinking about the US electricity sector and this sort of zero sum, stagnant growth kind of mentality. Now we have to be thinking about growth mode again. That's something that we really haven't grappled with in a while. And this is just the beginning, because if we get onto that net zero pathway, all of those consumer and industry adoption trends around electrification, they tend to follow an S-curve of adoption. Initially, they look exponential as the early adopters pile in. Then they kind of saturate and grow at more of a linear rate. And eventually, they get close to the market saturation, and they start to slow down again. Um, at the end. And this is how flat panel TVs or catalytic converters in cars or really any other early adoption of technology looks, some kind of logistic or S-curve. And that's the, the vehicle sales or new heat pump sales. And the stock of buildings and vehicles is what drives energy consumption. And that stock turnover is going to lag the sales because even once we get to 100% of vehicle sales, for example, as electric, only a fraction of the vehicles on the road turn over every year. 
And so we're going to have to have several years of sustaining that 100% you know, rate before 100% of the stock is turned over. And so what that means is that all of this is accelerating beyond 2035, along with a lot of uh, industrial electrification and hydrogen production, which become massive electricity consumers in that period. So we see a net zero pathway potentially doubling or nearly doubling electricity consumption between 2035 and 2050. So again, a 15 year period with 4.5% sustained growth. We haven't seen anything like that since the post-war era. So this is a huge thing, a shift to prepare for. And this is really only half the challenge because this is the growth, right? If we just meet this growth with clean electricity, emissions won't fall. They'll stay the same from the power sector as they are today. So we have to meet this growth and displace existing fossil fuels. And this is what makes clean electricity such a central part of the overall challenge. Um, at what I argue is sort of the linchpin in the overall net zero transition. So this is our electricity supply mix today. Uh, that's coal in gray and gas in red. That provides about 60% of our electricity in total. The gas share has been increasing, the coal share decreasing steadily over the last uh, decade. Uh, renewables and nuclear and hydro provide about 40% of our electricity today. So we're about four, uh, two fifths clean um, at the moment. By 2030, the amount of new clean electricity that we would have to add to be on track for our net zero goal to get to that 50% reduction across the economy um, would be equal to 1.5 times all of the current carbon-free generation in the country today. So one and a half times all the nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar that we have built to date. And by 2035, the new generation cumulatively would be equal to all current generation on the grid. So we basically have to build the entirety of the US generation mix all of the power plants in the country between now and 2035 if we want to be on track. That's an enormous undertaking, and that's just the first half, because then again, demand might grow by about double uh, over the next period. So by 2050, we effectively have to rebuild our current grid twice, right? That is a big lift, right? We as a country have not built infrastructure at this scale in my lifetime, right, in recent memory. So that, I think, is going to be a fundamental shift in how we think about the built environment around us, about getting used to seeing physical infrastructure going up, right? About how to address the costs and benefits and impacts of that infrastructure, right? Communities that see these wind farms or see the transmission lines that go along with them in their backyards are going to have to see some benefit from that, too, right? We can't just simply say, well, do it for the good of the country, right? And so we're going to have to have a very serious national conversation about this, I think, and a set of inf uh, institutional innovations that are fit for purpose for this task ahead of us. And this is really the next phase, I think, of the policy challenge. The economics makes this make sense, but does it make sense for individuals and communities that are gonna see this infrastructure affect their lives? That's a big open question, right? Will we have the social buy-in or license for this scale? Now, the good news, as I mentioned, is the economics are not the barrier. Not only have we shifted some of these costs onto the federal tax base to, to tax cheats and, and giant corporations, but also the underlying cost of these technologies has fundamentally changed in the last roughly decade. We've driven down the cost as humanity, you know, collectively across the world of lithium ion battery packs, which are the major cost component of an EV, but also our fastest growing source of grid storage, uh, power storage on the grid, and the cost of utility photovoltaics, solar PV panels, by roughly an order of magnitude, about 90%, since the last time Congress tried to pass uh, one of these clean energy laws in 2009, 2010. And the cost of onshore wind has fallen by about two thirds. So that has really transformed the economics and I think therefore the politics of what we think is possible. And again, these are the unsubsidized costs. Uncle Sam's gonna cover you know, 30 to 50% of the cost of this from here. So this is gonna require though record setting uh, clean energy construction um, to, to build things. So the economics is there. The, the pace of construction, as I mentioned, is what's staggering. This is a chart showing historical uh, build out of new clean electricity generation in the US uh, to date. See that big surge in the 70s and 80s? That's the last period of rapid trans uh, demand growth. That big uh, bulge of gray is natural gas power plants built in the 2000s when we deregulated electricity and gas markets. That opened things up to competition. A lot of private equity companies and others dumped a bunch of money into natural gas plants a little bit of irrational exuberance, built way too much, they all went bankrupt, but we still have all this generating capacity today. Um, and, uh, and then you see more recently the growth of wind and solar in, uh, in uh, blue for wind uh, and yellow for solar, which have increasingly made up almost all of the new capacity additions in the country on net. 
But this is the pace that we would need to sustain to be on track for net zero, to build all that new clean electricity I mentioned. Over the, between now and 2030, we would basically have to double the peak deployment rate that we've seen uh, in the past, and we'd have to sustain that on average. So the average rate over the next few years should be double the peak rate that we've seen to date. And then it should accelerate further at about 3.5 times that rate uh, through the 2030s. Now, the good news is that the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which is our statistics agency for energy, has projected that the solar industry is actually on track to do this, that this year and next year and the year after that, we will be averaging over 40 gigawatts of uh, new solar deployment. And that is double the peak uh, that I have in this chart of 20 gigawatts previously. So solar is pulling its weight. We're actually already ahead of schedule because that's by 2025. We're already at the average that we need if it accelerates beyond 2025 then the average between now and 2030 will actually be faster than we project here. The uh, unfortunate news is that the US wind industry has been facing some headwinds. Sorry for the pun. Um, they've been only growing at about six or seven gigawatts per year over the last couple of years. That's half of the peak 15 gigawatt pace that we saw in 2020 and uh, 2021. So uh, what, for whatever reason, I've um, just launched a new podcast. We're talking about this uh, next week. There's been a lot of things that uh, are, are holding back the, the wind industry. Um, but hopefully, this is going to work its way out. These are transitory impacts. And over you know, the next couple of years, we'll get back onto the, the pace that we have seen historically and start growing from there. If wind and solar can both get firing in all cylinders or all magnets or whatever the right analogy is, um, then we'll actually be on track to do this. So this is not out of the realm of feasibility. It's crazy fast, but maybe not impossible. To give a visual sense of what that looks like, and again, to put the emphasis on the challenge of actually building social license and buy-in for this infrastructure, this is a chart showing uh, all current utility scale wind. That's the light blue. Um, and if you look really closely, it's hard to see. There's some uh, large utility scale solar farms scattered about North Carolina, California, Minnesota, et cetera, in orange. This is the additional infrastructure that we would have to potentially build by 2035 to be on path for net zero. So the dark blue are new onshore wind farms. The purples are offshore wind farms. That's what we're focused on a lot here in New Jersey. Um, and then you start to see a lot more of the orange pop up all over the country, large utility scale solar being added at you know, tens or hundreds of gigawatts per year. So just to go again, we're going to roughly double the amount of onshore wind area, uh, build out a whole new offshore wind industry to do this and have solar be basically ubiquitously deployed across the country. Um, so that's, uh, a bit, you know, again, this is where it hits our, our lives. This is not a revolution of, you know, bits uh, in computers, right? This is physical stuff, copper, steel, cement, solar panels um, all around the country. And if we're going to connect all those renewable resources, tap into the areas where the best wind and solar potential is, and just simply to meet all that growing demand for electricity, whether it's from uh, coal or, or renewables, we're going to need more transmission lines. Right? So we're going to need a bigger grid to transport all that power around the country. And so our estimates from the repeat project are that we'll need on the order of 75,000 miles of new high voltage transmission lines between now and 2035. And to give us a sense of scale, that's enough to run from here to Los Angeles and back about 15 times. It's a lot. Okay. But again, maybe not impossible. If we look at the uh, average annual pace of expansion of the grid, it works out to about 2.3% per year. And there are innovative technologies that can allow us to get more out of existing transmission lines or to reconductor the current towers and get more along the, those paths, or to use energy storage in lieu of transmission to kind of buffer our time of use and get more out of the grid. And so all of that could knock down the total amount of transmission relative to this, maybe into the you know, less than 2% per year range. And if we look at the growth rate during the last period when electricity demand in the country was growing about the same pace as we're projecting, 1970s, 80s, early 90s, we were expanding the transmission grid at about that pace, about 1.9% per year. So we can build big things in this country, right? We're a big country. We've got a lot of wealth. We've got a lot of land. And we have expanded the grid at the pace that we're talking about, just not in recent memory, right, in the 1980s uh, and 90s. In recent years, we've expanded the grid by only about 1.2% per year. And we ran a transmission constraint scenario to see how much of a cost that would have if we weren't able to grow any faster than we have in the last few years. And what we found is that we would lose about half of all of the potential emissions reductions delivered by the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure law if we can't 
build faster than we build the grid faster than we have in the past. So what the reason for this is again that we'll be adding new electricity demand in EVs and heat pumps and everything else. And if we're not also adding clean electricity fast enough to both keep up with that growth and retire coal-fired power plants, then we'll just sort of be running to stay in place, right? We won't be able to deliver the emissions reductions that we need. And so uh, transmission expansion is going to become a central uh, enabler of the pace of progress that we need. I think we can go faster. Again, we've seen it in the past when demand was growing. We, we achieved this rate of growth uh, in the grid even when demand for electricity was flat, right? So if demand is growing, uh, it makes sense that we would be able to go faster than this. But again, we haven't done it in roughly 20 years. We haven't been building at the pace that we're talking about. So are our institutions ready for that? Are, you know, is society ready for that? That's the big open question. Again, I keep stressing that this is transformative. It's a huge amount of infrastructure. It's about getting back on a nation building kind of mentality that we haven't seen in a generation. But the good news is that it's not going to break the bank. This is not a World War II style mobilization of 20% of our economy, our workforce, our GDP, right? In fact, what we found in the Net Zero America study is that we can end up paying about the same amount as we have paid in the past for energy services or less as a share of our GDP. So in prosperous periods, putting aside financial crises and oil shocks, we've spent between 6 and 8% of our overall economic activity on energy services for businesses and households. And our Net Zero pathways from the Net Zero America study all actually spend less than that as a share of GDP over the next 30-year uh, you know, transition. So somewhere between three and six percent, uh, or four, sorry, four to six percent of GDP. Now more than a don't do anything world, where we just keep trying to you know, consume what looks like cheap fossil gas and put off paying the bill to future generations. But if we take this seriously and transition to net zero emissions, it's not gonna break the bank, right? These are technologies that are already relatively affordable now and will get more affordable as we deploy them at scale. Um, and we can do this with a reasonable amount of our uh, economic activity. Again, that's, uh, sorry, I put this in here twice, that's because wind and solar and battery costs are so cheap, and as we deploy the next generation of technologies, we will also likewise drive them down in cost. This happens due, through what academics call experience curves, um, uh, which is basically a correlation between scale of deployment, cumulative deployment, and the cost reductions we see for different technologies. What's actually behind that is competitive forces driving economies of scale and manufacturing or installations, progressive innovation and productivity improvements in manufacturing processes or installation workers, learning by doing, just getting better at this stuff in terms of the workforce and their skill set, all of which, and incremental innovations in terms of R&D working its way into products and into the world. And all of that steadily drives down the cost of new technologies, whether that's ships or airplanes built during World War II, or this was first kind of observed and, and documented, or solar and wind farms, which have come down dramatically in cost, or hydrogen electrolysis, or any other of the sort of technologies that we're looking at going forward. The exciting thing is that wind and solar are actually now the cheapest forms of electricity, of new electricity that you can get in most of the world. Not clean electricity, just electricity, period, thanks to the power of those experience curves. So when I started in this, you know, in this field in the mid-2000s, we called these technologies alternative energy technology, because they were crazy expensive relative to the conventional technology. Um, solar cost $350 a megawatt hour. That was about 10 times the wholesale rate. And wind, if you could get it for under $100 per megawatt hour, was, you know, a great deal. Now, you know, they're like $30, $35, $40 dollars a megawatt hour, roughly equal to the wholesale price of power, and cheaper than anything new you could build, natural gas, coal, or otherwise. So you might think, all right, we've made the alternatives cheaper than the conventional stuff. So we're done, right? Why do we need this massive law to help encourage the adoption? Shouldn't the private sector kind of take over from here? So I want to provide a little bit of intuition about how the electricity sector and economics work to show why we need to complement these resources and continue to use support to drive them faster at the scale that we need. And I'll start with an analogy. Comparing the cost of a wind farm or a solar farm to a uh, coal plant or a nuclear plant or even to each other, is a little bit like comparing the cost of a banana to the cost of a burger when you're trying to decide what you want to eat. Right? Bananas and burgers, they both provide calories. That's good. Right? You could sort of measure them in dollars per calorie terms, and the banana would be cheaper than the burger. But of course, that's not the only thing we need to eat. Right? We're not just raw calorie-consuming machines. Right? We need a balanced diet of all kinds of different nutrition. Sometimes those nutrition sources combine in interesting ways, like you eat rice and beans and you get a complete protein. Right? The amino acids from both give you a complete protein. Um, and in many cases, the stuff you eat has sort of diminishing value the more of it you eat. So the first bit of potassium in the banana 
really good for your muscles, but after you eat 150 bananas in a week, it's probably not doing very much for you. Same thing with burgers, the protein's great, but if you only eat burgers, I think your doctor's gonna yell at you, right? So, you know, these are kind of intuitive concepts that we're used to. These are partial substitutes, that's the point. Yes, electricity, you get, you know, kilowatt hours from a solar farm, you get kilowatt hours of electricity from a nuclear plant or a coal plant, but they have different characteristics, different attributes that we need a mix of in our electricity mix, our electricity supply, just like we need a balanced diet of foods, not just raw calories in our diet. So to understand why, I'll start a little bit of Electricity Markets 101. So in the electricity sector, we have the supply curve of all of the different sources of electricity that are available at a given time uh, on our grid. And the way we dispatch those or order them for operation, you know, which ones go first, are in what's called merit order or economic dispatch. So you start with the cheapest one first, and then the next most expensive, and then the next most expensive, and you line them all up. And that's what this supply curve shows. So cost on the y-axis, uh, megawatts of supply at a given time on the x-axis. You figure out how much demand for electricity you have, you intersect that with the supply curve, and you figure out which is the most expensive unit that you have to use, but no more expensive than that, right? I don't want to deploy one of these really expensive ones up in the corner when I have a cheaper one available because that would just raise the cost of supply for that moment. Demand for electricity, of course, goes up and down over the course of the day and the seasons and the year, and what that means is electricity prices also go up and down quite a lot more dramatically than any other commodity, uh, like um, you know, gasoline at the pump or, or whatever else. Um, and so we can see you know, prices go from zero or even or very low during one day to hundreds of dollars per megawatt hour on the same course of the same day. And over the course of the year, they vary from zero or negative even to uh, several thousand dollars per megawatt hour. So or, you know, several orders of magnitude variation. And that's all driven by the shape of this curve and the fact that demand is going up and down a lot, right? You can see that there's a steep part of the curve that's typical where we have a lot of really inefficient power plants that are cheap to own, but very expensive to operate. And we save those to only operate during very few hours of the year when we really need the most demand. So um, question for you, given this framework, Right? We dispatch the cheapest stuff first, and this is based on the marginal or fuel cost, not the cost of ownership. And then we sort of add them all up. What happens if we add wind or solar to the mix? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. More electricity. So what does that look like on the supply curve? You've got it. What would that? More exponential? OK, it pushes it out like this. You've got, it. You've got the right idea. Perfect. A round of pause, yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got more supply. And in particular, wind and solar are, are free, right? Well, there's no fuel cost. We're not burning ga natural gas or coal. We're just harnessing the wind. And they have a little bit of uh, operation and maintenance cost, but effectively, they're, they're zero marginal cost when we have them. They're free. Now, of course, you've got to pay for the plant, but the short run cost of operating it is, is free once you've bought it. And so what happens with wind and solar is that they act at, they come in at the bottom of the supply curve. So the more wind and solar we have, it's like shifting the supply curve out or same exact effect. You can think of it as subtracting from the net demand that has to be supplied by everything that's not renewable. And so what that does is it drives down the marginal cost of the last power plant that we have to use to meet that demand, right? So we lower costs, right? That's nice for consumers, right? Every time we have more wind or solar on the grid, we pay less for electricity in that hour. But if you're um, a renewable power plant, how do you pay for your fixed costs? Right? if you're, you're in this system. Well, you pay for it with what's called the inframarginal rent or the gross margin, the fact that you're paid the clearing price of the most expensive generator at that time, but you cost nothing. And so you get the difference between the two, right? You're not incurring any fuel costs. You're getting paid, say, $30 a megawatt hour, but you cost zero. And you, you pocket all that extra money, and you use that to pay off your investors and your debt on the power plant. And you pay the mortgage, effectively, on the power plant. So the challenge for renewables is the more and more of it that's available at any given hour, the less money they make. And this is particularly challenging for renewables because the weather correlates their output. You don't get to choose which hours to generate. So a natural gas plant might just turn off during this period and wait for a time when power prices are higher and it can make more money. But a wind farm, a solar farm doesn't do that. And it's not just that your wind farm or solar farm is producing a lot at this period of time. It's all of them across the same wide area because the weather is correlated. So everybody's solar panels are producing a lot during the middle of the day. And eventually, you get to periods that look like this as we add more renewables to the grid, where at a given time, all of the available electricity demand can be satisfied by renewables or nuclear or other very low-cost resources. And in those periods of time, 
the marginal cost of electricity, the price that is paid to generators and that we pay, is going to be zero. And so that's effectively telling the market, hey, this time of the day, cool it. We don't need any more renewables, right? What we really need are renewables during other times, or we need energy during other times when that renewable supply is not there, and maybe the supply curve looks more like this. So this is a good feedback loop. It's the market telling us that we want to change the times of day that renewables are available. In fact, it might even tell you, instead of pointing your solar panels south to produce the most energy during the middle of the day, you might want to point them east to produce the most as the sun is setting, right? You get less energy overall, but you get more valuable energy. And that's something that's actually happening in a lot of markets right now. If you have a rooftop that's facing east, right, it might make more sense to put panels there, if you had good uh, electricity rate design, at least. Um, and, but this presents a challenge for renewable operators because you know, you're dumping more and more energy into the grid. You're basically eating your own lunch, right? Your, your, your revenues are going down as more people generate in the middle of the day. And it also creates a, another challenge, uh, which in California, the folks uh, at the California system operator have called this the duck curve. It looks very similar in New Jersey because we also have a lot of solar now, which is that in the middle of the day, we have an abundance of electricity, right? From solar panels all over the state of California or New Jersey or other places. And so this is showing the, the net demand for electricity after taking out the solar uh, and renewables, the, the wind and solar, over time. So you can see that as we've added more uh, solar to the grid in California from 2015 down to 2023, we've steadily fattened the belly of the duck, right? Which is the middle of the day. We're pushing down the amount of other non-renewable resources that we need effectively to zero on a regular basis, at least during spring and fall. This is, I think, a, um, this is probably a May, a May or, or spring day. But of course, what we haven't done is budge much the head of the duck, which is the evening peak, right? Which happens around 8 or 9 p.m. People come home from work. The sun has set. They're all you know, firing up their you know, stoves and their lights and, and uh, heating their homes or cooling their homes. But the offices are still being cleaned. The lights are still on. Somebody's working late. And so we have both commercial and residential demand on at the same time. And that's the highest point of electricity demand. And you can add as much solar as you want to the grid. And it will, of course, not provide you any help after sundown. So it's also unable to shut down the capacity needs, the need to be able to dispatch power when we want it, in the evening hours. Wind helps a little bit. That's what's actually pushed it down. You can see from an old peak to the new peak. But solar clearly is not going to provide very much. And even with wind, what will happen is we'll need the most firm capacity during the periods when the wind isn't blowing, the doldrums that hit over a wide area when you have a high, pre weather front, uh, high pressure weather front. So what this means is that we can get a lot of energy from wind and solar. That energy is useful if it's displacing uh, more high you know, fuel cost resources like um, coal or gas and all the pollution that goes with them. And so we, I describe these as fuel-saving resources, but they, that fuel-saving value diminishes the more of it we deploy, and we can't really shut down the coal or gas or nuclear plants with wind and solar alone. Of course, you could say we could add some energy storage to the grid. So here's another uh, question for you all. If you're a battery operator, right, you take a lithium-ion battery pack like you put in an EV and you stick it in a shipping container and you wire it into the grid, how do you make your money? Any ideas? This, guy, this kid knows again, but anybody else? All right, we'll let him have it a try. No, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. And when do you buy it? Yeah, so you buy what you buy low and you sell high, right? It's a classic arbitrage play. We have any you know traders in here, right? You buy low, you sell high. So this is a you know basic arbitrage opportunity because all that free electricity is getting dumped into the grid in the middle of the day, and all of that demand you know peak is very stubborn in the evening. You could buy at noon and sell at 9 p.m., and then probably buy again in the middle of the night when power prices are lower, and sell again in the morning. So you might be able to get two cycles a day out of your battery, buying low, selling high. And you make your money as a battery operator primarily from two things. One is this arbitrage spread, right? The difference between the price you pay for it and the price that you sell your power. So the bigger the gap in these prices here, this is sort of the price curve that goes along with that supply curve I showed you before from the duck curve, um, the more money you make. And you can potentially make money for displacing the need to build gas or coal plants or other firm capacity. And the way you do that is by being able to sustain your output through that peak demand period. Because if I can provide a megawatt of power for enough time to meet that peak, I can shut off a megawatt of gas plant that I would otherwise need to sustain output during that period. So when the supply curve or the price you know, series looks like this, 
that a battery is really good for this, right? Because I can buy for zero, sell for high, and I only need to sustain my output for that little sliver of the top of the curve during the peak period. So I might only need three megawatt hours of storage for every megawatt of capacity I want to shut down. All right, so that's good. That's where we are right now in markets like California or New Jersey or elsewhere where we're starting to see large scale commercial storage deployment at thousands of megawatts per year scale. I think California added something like 6,000 megawatts of storage in 2023. That's like six nuclear power plants. So it's a lot. So they're all chasing this money. Now, unfortunately, like any arbitrage opportunity, the more people who buy when the price is low, the higher the low price gets. And the more people that sell when the price is high, the lower the high price gets. So you're going to squeeze your own arbitrage play the more storage that's happening in the grid. right? So it's, again, good for consumers. We start paying nice flat rates. But it presents a challenge as you deploy more and more storage. right? You're making less money each time you buy low and sell high. And if you want to displace that firm capacity, you're going to have to start sustaining your output over many more hours, because you've already flattened the peak, and it's nice and flat now. So I might need to, say, sustain my output for 12 or 16 or 36 hours, or maybe even five days eventually, when the grid looks something like this, right? when I've got a lot of storage uh, going back and forth. So this makes it limited uh, in the amount of battery capacity that we can deploy before we have to turn to something else. So just like in our diet, more of something is great at the beginning, but eventually it loses its value. And we need the right combination of all of these things. In fact, we can think of it like a basketball team, too. If you only have a star point guard, you can move the ball around the court really well, but you're probably not going to win the NCAA championship. And so good thing for our Princeton Tigers, we have excellent players on all of the positions on the field, and that's why we're going to go uh, win the Ivy League this year uh, and head back to the NCAA. We will, trust me. So what we need in the electricity mix is a similar balance of resources. I've already talked about how wind and solar mostly get their value from fuel saving, right? They displace natural gas and coal. But once we've driven all the gas and coal out, they can't really do much more um, during the times when the wind and solar are blowing, that is. Then we can add flexibility resources or balancing resources that can help move supply or demand around in time and better line up with the availability of renewables. That's where batteries come in, moving supply around, or demand scheduling, charging at the times, you know, taking my EV to work and charging when there's lots of solar output during the middle of the day, right? So moving demand around in time, that helps. But those are limited, right, as I've shown you before. And so what we need are technologies that I call firm, low carbon technologies that are available any time of the day for as long as you need them, any time of the year. And for now, we're dependent on natural gas power plants for this role. But there's a range of emerging technologies that could fit this role. And that includes advanced geothermal, nuclear fission, or even eventually fusion, as folks here at PPPL are working on, gas or coal with carbon capture, bioenergy, or hydrogen or other net zero carbon gases that we can burn in power plants or use in fuel cells. And fortunately, the infrastructure law also contemplates the need for this and the Inflation Reduction Act by providing billions of dollars of demonstration funding for basically all of those technologies I just mentioned, low-cost loan guarantees to help finance the first-of-a-kind projects, and tax credits for all carbon-free sources. So for whichever ones work out, they'll have uh, long-term tax credits available to help spur their deployment. And that's going to take a bunch of these technologies from science fiction, from these concepts that were on paper when I first started uh, studying this, to real-world power plants built in the next couple of years. There are gas-fired power plants with carbon capture that are being constructed now, will be online in 2027, 2028. All of the major vendors of gas turbines are working on tweaking their designs to be able to burn 100% hydrogen without um, having too much NOx emissions, nitrogen oxides, which is the key uh, challenge for hydrogen combustion. Small modular nuclear reactor companies are moving into the market, um, probably won't be building until the late uh, uh, part of the decade or the 2030s, but there's about a dozen different companies pursuing these designs, along with several well-capitalized fusion startups. The one I'm probably most excited about in the near term is advanced geothermal energy. I'm in the advisory board of one company, and we do research with another. Um, they're building their commercial power plants right now. In fact, one uh, enhanced geothermal company flipped the switch on their first commercial plant in Nevada uh, at the end of last year. Another one is building uh, uh, outside of Munich. It'll be online this year. So these are real power plants that'll be generating power on our grid right now using advanced technologies that can make geothermal a much broader, more accessible resource around the world. And a whole bunch of different companies are pursuing very low cost, long duration energy storage so that you really can manage to be cheap enough to avoid, afford to not earn too much on your spread and, uh, and sustain your output over long enough periods 
that you could really uh, step in and substitute quite dramatically for the amount of firm capacity we need. So what's exciting is that we're building these things now, but venture capital has funded it, the federal government is backing it, innovative companies are out there building them in the world, companies like Google and utilities are buying the power and saying we'll sign up to do it. Um, and over the next few years, we're gonna see which of these actually work, which become reality and not science fiction. Until then, we can keep our existing natural gas plants running and use them less and less. This is important. We don't want to shut these things down until we have cleaner alternatives available, because if we do, it'll slow the pace at which we can shut down coal plants, which are much dirtier. The things that we don't like about natural gas, whether it's hydraulic fracturing and all of the impacts there, or methane leaks across the pipeline network, or combustion emissions and pollution, all scale with how much gas we burn, not how many gas power plants are sitting around waiting for that one week when we don't have enough wind or solar power. right? So it's important to keep in mind it's the megawatts that we need, not the megawatt hours, right? Not the energy, but the power. We'll displace those megawatt hours with lots more wind and solar. We'll displace some of this with batteries or just augment it to keep up with demand growth. But we're not going to be able to really replace these plants until we have low-cost clean energy alternatives. All right, I'm going to wrap up here. I know I'm eating up some of the question time, but uh, this is basically the decarbonization playbook. And I want to be clear that, like, when I started working in this, uh, in my PhD, you know, I guess a decade ago now, this was not clear. There was a whole bunch of open questions about what the mix would look like. Some of that clarity has come from research, like the type that my group does. Some of it has just come with seeing what actually worked in the real world, right? We've got another decade of experience. We actually know what wind and solar cost now. They're way different than they cost a decade ago. We've seen how fast batteries have improved. We've seen which of these low carbon firm technologies are actually getting built. So what we know now is that we have to start by building wind and solar at a record pace, right? Faster and faster every year to keep up with the demand growth and to drive out the amount of gas and coal we need. We're going to have to expand the grid and energy storage to complement and connect those resources and to um, meet those peak demands in the most effective way we can. First order of operations to drive down emissions is to retire our coal-fired power fleet. Coal is incredibly polluting per megawatt hour. It causes a huge amount of asthma, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and other impacts. And uh, megawatt hour for megawatt hour, it produces about twice as much CO2 as natural gas. So the first order of operations from a carbon perspective is get rid of the coal. We can probably phase out all of our coal-fired power plants across the country by around 2030 if we focus on this game plan. But to do that, we're going to have to preserve our existing nuclear fleet which provides about the same as much electricity and about half as much capacity as coal today. So we can't sort of do this at the same time that we're retiring coal, or we'll have to go twice as fast, and we'll be substituting carbon-free generation for carbon-free generation while we're still operating dirty fossil power plants, and that's not the right order of operations. So I commend the state of New Jersey for stepping in and ensuring that we keep our existing nuclear foundation in place as we push towards 100% clean electricity. When we get to 100% clean, then we can revisit the role of our existing fleet. We're going to have to maintain natural gas capacity, at least on net, but again, use these power plants less and less. And I say on net because we have some really old gas plants, steam turbines and others, we probably can get rid of. Some parts of the country might need to build a little bit more to rapidly retire coal. Other parts could maybe get, rid, get uh, by with less, with more storage. But our modeling shows that around, uh, around the country on net, we probably need to maintain about the same amount of gas capacity as we have today. And we found that these steps alone, which again, rely on existing technologies that are already affordable, and plus what's already on our grid, can get us to an 80 to 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions between now and 2035, while paying bulk supply costs, so wholesale electricity supply costs, about the same or even less than we pay today. So this does not rely on any new novel technologies. There's no reason to wait to do any of this. It's not going to cost an arm and a leg. We can do it now, and we can get 80 to 90% of the way there. And to get the rest of the way there, all the way to 100%, we just have to do two more things and we're already on the track. We need to deploy as many of these clean firm technologies and long duration storage technologies as we can over the next decade. Build them at commercial scale, kick the tires, figure out what works, figure out what they cost and how quickly we can drive down the costs. And then pick those that make the most sense economically and for each region around the country and steadily displace our natural gas capacity with these new clean technologies in the 2030s and 2040s. If we do this, by 2045, we could be running the entire country on a 100% carbon-free grid that's roughly double the size of our current grid today. That's what we got to do. Easy peasy, right? Thanks for uh, having me today. I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you.
just this was super interesting. Don't be surprised if you see me in the back of your <laughs> auditorium when you Sounds when good. you're teaching in Princeton. Uh, yeah, so we have time for some questions. Great. Mike Syria. Grab that one, and then let's get one over here. Britt, let's start with your. Yeah, let's start with your question. Britt, somebody over here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor, for putting together a wonderful talk today. Is that on? Is can can you just get a little bit closer to your to your mouth? Yes. In the meantime, I encourage folks online to raise your hands if you have questions. Uh, thank you, Professor, for putting together such a wonderful talk today. The I understand methane is also one of the you know gases that produces probably is more harmful than uh, carbon dioxide. But in the mix of things, uh, can you give a, a little insight into for one unit of carbon dioxide how harmful it is as compared to one unit of methane, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. So methane is a very potent greenhouse gas while it resides in the atmosphere. Um, so it absorbs a lot more heat and re-radiates it, uh, acts as a more effective insulator than carbon dioxide. The big difference between CO2 and methane is that methane is photodegraded by sunlight, and it breaks down over time into constituent parts, into uh, free radicals and CO2, I believe. Um, uh, I know the CO2 parts, right? I don't know where the rest of the, the hydrogen parts go, but I think into to, um, hydroxyl atoms. Um, molecules and so that's so it basically turns over time into co2 and then the co2 stays in the atmosphere for centuries time scale so what that means is that if you integrate the forcing function over time or how much it warms uh if the shorter the time period the more you care about uh methane and the less you care about co2 the longer the time frame the more you care about co2 and the less you care about methane and so in um the a lot of the accounting there are sort of two simplified ways to look at this uh, one is integrating over a 20-year period, so the global warming potential over a 20-year period, or GWP20. And the other is the global warming potential over a century time scale, over a 100-year period, GWP100. On the GWP20 scale, um, methane, I believe, is something like 80 times higher, more powerful, or 65-ish, I think, than, than, um, uh, than CO2. But over the 100-year period, it's only about 30 times more powerful per, per molecule, per ton. Um, and eventually that attenuates to equal because it just turns into CO2. And so the way I, whereas CO2 is basically permanent. So the way I think about this is that, you know, it's a 90% approximation because it does eventually turn into CO2, but methane's effectively a flow problem, right? It's more like conventional pollution. Once I reduce it, its harms go away pretty quickly. CO2 is a stock problem. It's about how much we put up there cumulatively between now and the moment we get to net zero. And so if you worry a lot about near-term warming, like we're about to hit some tipping point that you care about or something like that, then methane is a really powerful thermostat you can turn up or down pretty quickly to drive down you know, warming or drive up warming, you know, depending which, which way you're going. Whereas CO2, it's about the cumulative amount. And so if you're, what you're really worried about is the long-term you know, geologic timescale, human, you know, human civilization shaping impacts of global warming over long time scales, then cumulative CO2 emissions are more important. And so it's really just a you know, kind of a moral question judgment call. You can't really make them equal to each other. It depends on where you are in time. Um, if you count for the methane leakage upstream from uh, gas power plants, it depends on how much is leaking. But that can, in potential, like very high leakage rates, close the gap between coal and gas over the short time frame. So they basically have the same impact. But over long time frames, gas is always, you know, better than coal under reasonable assumptions. An important thing that the U.S. is doing with the only stick in the Inflation Reduction Act, which is mostly incentives and carrots, right, is a new fee on methane pollution in the oil and gas sector. So they're now basically paying a carbon tax on methane leaks uh, all throughout the supply chain. And the EPA just finalized in December for the first time new emission standards for methane pollution. And so when you put those two together, we expect methane emissions from oil and gas to dramatically decline over the next decade. You combine that with new satellite monitoring technologies that are up now seeing where the, where the methane emissions are, and we know exactly who's polluting. We don't have to rely on their self-reporting anymore. And so I, I'm very optimistic that we can drive down methane leaks upstream while we also drive down our consumption of natural gas in power plants and homes through renewables and electrification. And that's gonna be the challenge for the next decade or so. We're still gonna need gas, but, um, and it's still gonna be better than coal, but uh, we're gonna use less of it. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna make it less methane emitting over time. Great. That's the question right there. Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
I was just wondering what is it working? Mm-mm. I don't think so. I was wondering Maybe. what um because I heard that um wind turbines run on diesel uh engines. I don't know if that was a while ago. I don't know if they're still doing that. So the um so wind turbines uh wind turbines need to move uh to face the wind. Um and so sometimes when they're not energized they have uh, diesel generators, small ones on them, that can allow you to, to run the motors that pivot the wind farms into the wind. You would only use that if the whole wind farm is not producing power, because otherwise you'll just use the electricity that's available on the grid to, to actuate the wind turbines. So they do have diesel generators on them. They do not run on diesel generators. They run on the wind. So it's not like they're burning diesel every time they're spinning. They might burn diesel for a minute to start up operations when the whole wind farm is becalmed, and they need to get uh, pivoted into the wind, um, but not that's not like a regular thing. All right. I was yeah. also wondering, um, well, if you're if we're going to uh, cut gas emissions, that we also need to rely on some sort of energy while we try to achieve the net zero goal, mm -hmm. um, and that's through nuclear power plants. But what are we going to do with all of the nuclear waste that it will produce yep. by the time we reach net zero? So. Um, it's one of those things that I learned as, you know, sort of studying our energy options that really fundamentally changed how I perceive nuclear power. If you had to imagine how much nuclear waste we've produced over the entirety of the lifetime of operations of our existing nuclear fleet, how, like, it, how, many, how many football stadiums do you think that would fill up? You think it would be thousands, millions, billions, Somewhere dozens? Somewhere in the range. A couple hundred? It would fit, well, if you stack them all up, it might be one. It's about... I think it's about eight football fields if you've put out the, the containers all around. We have about 65,000 tons of high you know, volume, uh, I mean, uh, um, of high, uh, highly radioactive nuclear waste from our existing nuclear fleet. That's the stuff that we have to worry most about. Um, tons is a little bit misleading because it's incredibly dense. So uh, if you think about that, it's, it's really, we can put these things in dry cast storage containers that are about twice as tall as a person and about this big around. Um, I could stand right next to one, and there'd be zero radiation coming through the walls of those. They're designed to be hit with, uh, with rockets or jet, jet, you know, fighter jets and withstand the impact of that because we were designed to be able to ship them around the country to long-term waste repositories. So that's where the reactors store their waste after they've cooled down, after the initial period that they're removed from the reactor. They go into a coolant pool first for a, about a year and a half or two years, and then once they're cool enough, they go into these dry cast storage containers. And so right now, they're all around the country at the site of existing nuclear power plants. And you can see the entire lifetime of operation of one of these plants, which cranks out about a, uh, enough energy for um, a, a city of a million people, right? About, um, well, even more than that, about 800,000 households per nuclear reactor. Um, so you think about the number of households, there's two and a half people in a household. So that's like, a, you know, almost two million people worth of energy. It has been operating for 30, 40 years. It might have four or five of these dry cast storage containers. That's all of the waste. So it's a challenge. We have to figure out what to do with it. But what I had in my mind was this huge amount of nuclear waste just sort of like pouring out of the nuclear plants that we'd have to figure out what to do with. The reality is you can stick it in dry cast storage containers. You can safely store it for centuries time scales, you know, a couple centuries, and we'll figure out what to do with it, right? I think we can do it. There's, there's existing solutions. Um, Norway and Finland are opening, ge or Finland and Sweden are opening geologic repositories where they drill way down into the bedrock and they store it down there because you don't need to store much. It's not that hard to do. Politically in the US, it's been difficult to cite. We've had a sort of political football in Nevada around uh, Yucca Mountain that's been kicked around for a couple you know, decades. Um, but for now, it, they're perfectly safe. It'd be nicer if they're all in one or two places around the country that were easier to guard, but they're not producing any you know, radioactive harm to the environment. They're in dry cast storage containers. So yeah, we gotta figure that out, but I think we can probably figure that out if we can figure out how to solve climate change and rebuild our entire energy economy. It's a challenge, it's a manageable one, there's good engineers already on it. There's countries that are a little more deliberative than we are that have already figured out long-term solutions like Finland. Um, so that's, that's the thing that changed for me. It, you know, it contrast that to the amount of coal that we burn. We, burn. we used to burn about a billion tons of coal every year in the US. We still burn three billion tons globally. Um, so billion tons a year, right? And all of that produces coal ash that has to be stored somewhere and is full of heavy metals like mercury. And, a little, and when we burn it, it releases radiation as well because there's little bits of um, radioactive material in it. So like, it's just not even close to the same kind of risk that we face from fossil fuels. So let's focus on that, keep the reactors safe, keep their fuel safe, and we'll figure out a long-term strategy. All right. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. Go ahead. Hi. 
Uh, thank you for your, for your talk. Um, one of the things that um, kind of troubles me um, about energy storage of the laws of thermodynamics. Um, this morning, I checked the uh, CO2 Mauna Loa uh, Observatory. This morning, um, we're over 5 ppm higher for week five than we were in 2023, okay? And it's the emissions are accelerating. They're not declining. That's okay. not that's not true. The, the rate of growth is decelerating. They're well, if you, no, the well if you look at the CO2 in the atmosphere, it, it's definitely true. It's now, just look at the, the numbers. Um, but in, in any case, the, um, the laws of thermodynamics um, apply to energy storage. Sure. And so uh, I was 24 when the International Journal of uh, Hydrogen Energy was founded. I'm 71 now. I used to hear by 2000, by 2020, now 2050. Um, I, I'm hearing a lot of questions about materials, okay? Um, a wind turbine has all kinds of lanthanides in it. Batteries have cobalt. Yeah. So Is it really sustainable? required for all of this? Yeah. And, and the land, I mean, yeah. the Diablo Canyon produced more electricity in nine acres than 1,500 square miles yeah. of wind. That's one of the advantages of nuclear power, yeah. So yes, you need materials to build all this stuff. Um, again, remember we, use, we burn several billion tons of coal every year. We mine billions of tons of iron every year. We make billions of tons of cement every year. We need a few thousand tons of you know, rare earth metals every year to do this kind of stuff, to build batteries. We need a few thousand tons or tens of thousands of tons of lithium. Yeah, we're gonna still have to dig stuff up. It's gonna be an order of magnitude or two less than what we do now, just to dig stuff up and burn it every year. And all those things are recyclable, right? So yeah, we gotta build it as we're building out the first time, but a lot of that can be reclaimed every year, including from batteries and from some solar panels and others. So yeah, I mean, we're never gonna be a zero impact society on the earth, right? But we can reduce the impact of materials extraction by probably two orders of magnitude. And as far as the laws of thermodynamics go, I mean, lithium ion batteries are 90% round trip efficient. That's, that's consistent with the first law and the second law, but uh, they're quite efficient. Um, and uh, hydrogen is quite inefficient if you try to turn it back into electricity. Um, it's only about 40% or so round trip efficiency. Um, but that's why we have to use as little of it as possible, right? And focus on direct electrification wherever we can. So hydrogen really should only be used in applications where it's not feasible to directly electrify. And that's where we're trying to move the, the, the policy environment right now in the US. Great, we're gonna have our two last questions. The, first, the back and the one over there. Go ahead. I have two questions. Uh, one of the things that you addressed was the United States, but this is a global problem. Indeed. Uh, to what extent is the plateau that you cited in the increased demand for electricity due to increased import of manufactured items? And my other question has to do with the hydrogen. Uh, given our experience with the Hindenburg, uh, what is the safety of the use of hydrogen fuel? Sure. Um, so in terms of emissions, um, there have been a couple of studies, there have been several studies on this trying to account for sort of consumption-based emissions, which account for imports versus our direct production. Um, it shifts the baseline up. Again, we were importing a lot before 2005 as well, so it's not like it was zero and it went up from there. It was, you know, high and it went higher. Um, so if you account for that, I think it, if I'm remembering correctly, it's sort of on the order of a 15% shift in the baseline, but the trend line is still going down at the same pace. So, um, you know, if we take responsibility for our imported emissions, then instead of 6.6 .6 billion tons, it's maybe seven and a half or eight billion tons of total, but it's been declining still by a billion tons on net. Um, so it doesn't change the picture too much. It just shifts the baseline. Um, now, of course, a lot of that's coming from China. China is now the world's biggest emitter. Um, but even in China, they're also not only the world's fastest, you know, uh, deployer of coal plants, they're also the fastest deployer of nuclear power, hydro, wind, solar, EVs, everything. Um, and so what is exciting to watch is how these technologies have permeated through the Chinese economy, have now contributed a substantial amount of their actual economic growth. So like their growth engine is now through clean energy, building it for themselves and deploying it around the world. Um, and it looks like their emissions may have peaked. So last year they, they, um, they were pretty much flat. 
This year, the projections are they could decline. Um, and we'll see if they sort of undulate along. Um, but that's important because China has committed to peaking its emissions by 2030 on the global stage. And when that announcement was made, uh, I think in 2014 or 15, people were not convinced that could happen, right? China was on a huge upward growth trajectory. And it looks like they may have not only hit that by 2030, but may have hit it early. So I'm very keen to watch what happens over the next year or two to China's emissions. If it is indeed peaked, that's an incredibly optimistic sign for our trajectory, because until China's emissions have peaked, we're not gonna see the global peak start to, you know, start to decline. So some encouraging signs, um, we're not sure yet. You know, one year is not enough to draw a trend line, uh, but that's a big shift from the like, steady four or 5% increase per year that we saw before. Um, so, you know, we often hear a lot about, well, why should we do this if China's not pulling their weight? Actually, they are. They're pulling more than their weight, probably, given the where they are in their stage of economic development, and it's time for us to do our job, too. Oh, and hydrogen, yeah, don't let it blow up. <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, sorry, yeah, you need to store it safely, um, and you should probably not have it running around in lots of small cars all over the place or fueling stations, have it in a few large industrial facilities where we can't electrify things those are the main applications for hydrogen. So the best use case for hydrogen is actually uh, producing primary steel through direct reduction of iron without needing to use coke and coal and blast furnaces anymore. That uses a huge amount for, as a reductant, not as a fuel, but as a oxidizer, right, or a reductant agent. Um, other use cases are displacing all the hydrogen we currently use to make fertilizer or to do hydro treating for uh, refineries and things like that. Um, eventually you might use them in synthetic fuels production to make you know, synthetic jet fuel or things like that, or methanol for ships. But I don't see any use cases in light duty vehicles, maybe in long haul trucking, although you know, electric batteries have gotten so good that they're starting to compete even in that space too. So um, yeah, so don't let them, you know, let, let's keep it safe, but not like gasoline is a non-flammable substance, right? <laughs> or natural gas that's piped around in everybody's homes. You know, it also explodes, so yeah. Yes, thank you for this excellent and comprehensive talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's very encouraging that the the price, uh, the cost competitiveness of, mm -hmm. of all these technologies has really reached a point where they win economically. Yeah. And in a capitalist economy, that's important. That yeah. usually you know helps. Yep. Um, so much so that like my senior citizen parents got solar panels on yeah. the roof about six years ago, and they've just about paid off. And then they'll just have decades free power. of free mm -hmm. free power. Um, so looking at the curve for what we need in terms of increased energy generation, uh, electricity generation in particular, through 2050, um, when we think of power generation historically, we think of centralized, right? Power plants shipping to our homes. Yep. So my question is, how much of your modeling of that takes into account millions of residents mm -hmm. getting solar panels on yep. the roof, basically carrying the load for the power companies instead of having to build a centralized plant. Yep. We all do it in a distributed fashion with little, pro lots of little projects versus big, massive you know, infrastructure yep. projects. Thank I you. mean, in most things, it's both and. <laughs> so yes, solar can be distributed. It's really the only technology that we're talking about here other than batteries that can be distributed. So we can do batteries and solar you know, throughout the grid in different scales and locations. Wind farms are gonna have to be centralized. You know, Small wind turbine generators on roofs really don't do much of anything. We don't tend to live in the places that are super windy either. Um, and wind power output goes up with the wind speed cubed. So it really is important to be in a good wind speed location, right? If you have twice as good wind power output or, or wind speeds, you get eight times as much wind power output from the turbines. Solar power is linear with the amount of solar resource. So you go to the best place in the country versus the worst place, and it might only be producing twice as much in Arizona as in you know, Maine. So we have a lot more flexibility to site it in different places. And because the panels are so modular, it's easy to build them at different scales. So that's exciting. It gives us new opportunities within the grid. It also is a challenge for how we price electricity and do, you know, create the incentives for your parents or for you and I right, to, to put these panels on our homes. Or to think about when we charge our EVs or how we operate our heat pumps. Right? There's a lot of choices that are going to be affected by the rate design, how much you pay for electricity. So uh, most of us don't think at all about our electricity bills, right? You probably pay it once a month. You maybe look at the bill, or maybe it's just on auto pay. You have no idea what the actual value or price of electricity is at a given time. And as I showed you before, because demand is going up and down, we have the supply curve that looks like this, the value is going up and down a lot. And so, what, uh, so that's one thing. We don't know what that price is. <laughs> and the second is that we price our networks by volume. So we pay for all the network infrastructure for every kilowatt hour we consume. 
And that doesn't really make any economic sense because it's the size of the wires, not how many you know, kilowatt hours go through them, that drives uh, how much infrastructure we need. So it's the peak coincident usage of that network, not the amount of kilowatt hours that go through it. And this has become a little bit problematic with solar PV because yes, you can deploy it at a distributed level. Unfortunately, there are economies of scale for installation costs and permitting and site acquisition. You know, if you build one giant wind farm, you, build your, you bring your crew and they go do, 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 you know, build everything really quickly. To build the same amount on a bunch of roofs, you've got to go sign up, you know, 6,000 people and build a small custom system on everybody's house. So today it costs about three times as much to put a solar panel on our roofs as it does to build the same amount of solar uh, panels in a utility scale solar farm, like the one that Princeton built down the road. Oh, and those panels are optimally cleaned and tra have trackers and they produce more output than the ones on your roof. So unfortunately, we're paying about three or four times as much for the electricity that comes from a household than the utility scale farms, even though they're modular. And you don't see any feedback that like the utility scale solar farms do about what the value is of more solar on the roof. So again, dumping more solar into the grid at middle of the day is not all that valuable. But the way we pay for solar at home is through volumetric credits. So every kilowatt hour you produce is worth the same, no matter when you produce it. And this has become a problem in places like Hawaii and California with very high penetrations. So they've begun to change these rules to try to give people feedback to say, actually, what we don't want is more power during the middle of the day when you're not home and your solar panels are cranking out more than you need. What we want is more power in the evening when you do come home. So maybe put your panels east or maybe install a battery to use that or maybe just don't install solar at all because it's not worth the cost anymore. And we have to really think carefully in New Jersey about the incentives that we're setting for, for, for solar as well, because it made economic sense for your parents to install it, but that doesn't reflect the actual cost or value of the solar system. There's lots of subsidies embedded in there. And it may be that we could use our, our, our money, our public money, more effectively to build more larger scale solar farms throughout New Jersey or offshore wind. And indeed, when we run our models, that's what we see. So that's a long-winded answer of saying, it's great that we can distribute these technologies. It gives us more options. We need to think more carefully about how we incentivize them so they're built where they actually make economic sense for everybody, not just for the household that builds them. And in our modeling, we assume you know, maybe 20% of the overall solar build-out is distributed, but most of it is still central station because it still is cheaper to build, even when you factor in the wires that you need to get it from here to there. Um, so New Jersey has been very uh, overly emphasized, in my view, on rooftop solar as a policy matter. We should be trying to build in the state as whatever solar at whatever scale is most cost effective to meet our needs. Sometimes that's gonna be on rooftops, but a lot of times it would be in larger installations. And we're just starting to support that through the Solar Energy Act of 2021 that is finally starting to do some larger scale solar build outs. But historically, it's just not been on the docket for, for New Jersey. Fantastic. So uh, Professor Jenkins, this, you know, as, as you can tell, we can stay here for another hour. Yeah. <laughs> this. So if you're up for sticking around for a few minutes and taking some questions, sure. if you have to go. Yeah, first, I can, but... I can say for a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. And so let's give our speaker a round Thanks of applause. Very much for a great talk.